What's up everybody? As you can see, I'm back today and I am joined by the very intelligent, the very articulate, the very funny, the very dapper Cash Boyle. How are you, my friend? I'm very well, thank you. Um, thanks for that introduction. That was probably much more praise than I deserve. But yeah, thank you very much. I am good. How are you? I'm tickety-boo, Cash, as always. Every time we go to record, we say, right, let's start at 8 o'clock. And then we spend half an hour talking and then time goes by and we're then up against it. And we're like, oh, shit, we better get this sorted. But we do have a lot to get through. I know it's it's the down season, but transfer rumours are coming in thick and fast. The preseason games are coming up and we have a lot of stuff to, uh, to cover. So, look, I'm going to get straight into it, Cash. I want to have a chat before anything else, about the ticket pricing of the Reds' pre-season tour to America. So tickets for the clash with Dortmund in Notre Dame are being sold for as much as $423 with fees, uh, with the friendlies against Sevilla in Boston up to $167 and Sporting in New York up to $186. That's taken the piss. $423 for a genuine ticket. Like, this isn't a secondary market. $423 to watch the Reds play Dortmund. It, it is madness. Like, when I saw... Um that this was something we discussed. I actually took the liberty to go away and do some research, not to do with the pricing, which obviously is, is, is confirmed, but I actually looked at the average UK and US salary, assuming you're going to get people coming over from the UK and people obviously, when it's in the US, going from the US. So this these, these figures are from this year, from 2019. The average UK wage is £569 a week. The average US wage is $905 a week, which is £713. Now, if you look at those games, the Dortmund the Dortmund friendly works out at about £333 sterling, £131 for the Sevilla game, and £146 sterling for the sporting game. So, sorry to throw loads of numbers at you, but what I'm trying to articulate is that you're essentially charging, particularly for the Dortmund game, you're charging more than half of the average UK weekly wage and you're charging just under half of the average US weekly wage. That's the average, not assuming that people people earn above and below that. Obviously, it varies. So it, you've got to look at it and put some perspective on it. I mean, they're obviously the commercial aspect of the tours. You can't ignore it because that's why they do them. Jurgen Klopp has openly said that he doesn't really like doing them. You know, I mean, he said it in all but words. You know, he openly sort of has an apathy toward them, but he accepts that's a commercial element of the game that you have to accept when you are a world global club. And, and, and that's fine, but make it so that fans can afford it. Make it so that, you know, the Liverpool fans one trip, or sorry, the Liverpool fans who have one opportunity maybe per year to see the team play because they might not be able to get over from the US to Anfield or whatever, make it affordable for them to go. Make them feel like they can truly be part of the experience for that one game and I think as I said I'm sorry to overload you with figures and, and averages and so on but if you look at the evidence the evidence suggests that you're overcharging for what isn't a competitive match and that's not really fair what I would say is I'm, I'm guessing that this $423 is absolutely the top level ticket and I'm guessing that there probably is more reasonably priced tickets but that really isn't the point what you're saying is true this could be a once in a lifetime, a once every five years trip for some people. I know American Reds who, who drive three, four, five hours just to get to a friend who like that. Um, and the fact that it's Dortmund, it seems like they're almost doubling up, trebling up the price just because of the sexiness of that whole Klopp vibe and the, the closeness between the fans of Liverpool and Dortmund. Well, yeah, exactly. I think there's no. it's not a coincidence that um, the Dortmund game is you know double the price and more of the other two. Now, I think... As you correctly pointed out, you've got uh, fans who live in the US and they have to drive however long to even attend the match. You know, that adds in an extra additional cost. Um, and as you also pointed out correctly, it, that will be the top bracket for tickets. And I'm not I'm not denying that. But, you know, there's no world in which anything, any ticket should be that price for a friend. I don't care how top bracket it is. I mean, that's that is extortion. It doesn't matter, you know, how many frills and spills they put on it. And I think... You know, you can't, I don't think the club really, in good faith, can peddle the whole narrative of, you know, we are Liverpool, this means more, but then be like, actually, this means more, pay us this amount of money to watch our team play. You know, and it's notwithstanding the fact that you're not going to have your full squad on that tour, you're not going to have all your stars, because obviously there's other international commitments that will preclude their involvement. So, you know, you've got fans playing whatever amount of money for... um 
you know, potentially not even all of Liverpool's stars to be there. So I think there's a bit of a a bit of a murky sort of taste about it, um, particularly with the, the Dortmund markup. And I think the club really has to sort of comply with its own philosophy and its own kind of policy of putting the fans first or allegedly putting the fans first. Yeah, it's just thinking about it there for a second while you were going through the prices and stuff. It's basically second tier from top level Champions League final ticket price, if memory serves me correct. And yeah, the club will point out that maybe they don't set these ticket prices. Maybe the club are paid a set fee to come over and do this and maybe how the ticket and allocations and pricing is done is not down to them. I don't know. But what I will say is, yeah, the club will also do some great things while they're over there. They'll touch base with American Reds. They'll give media opportunities to people who may not usually get them. And so many good things. We're not just here to knock the club. But at the same time, we're a fan channel. And our interests are in the are aligned with the interests of fans over in America or in Australia or in Asia, or whoever gets to see the Reds in a preseason tour. I know when they come to Dublin, they would be laughed out of Dublin if they tried to charge those prices in the Aviva for anybody to go see Liverpool. I think... 70 quid was probably the most expensive ticket, if I remember, when Liverpool came over, 70 euro, which is about 60 pound. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think there's 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 definitely a bit of, um, there's a knowledge that you can maybe go to these places and charge these prices and there won't be as much opposition as there would be in, for example, Dublin. But I, what, what I do believe is that you're creating this idea that, I mean, fans know what the price is going to be ahead of time, like a year ahead of time. So they're going to, some people are going to have to start saving for that now. I mean, if you want to go and take your, you know, if you wanted to go and take your two kids to the Savay game, for example, and you pay, not top range, but, you know, let's say in excess of $100 per ticket, which is possible, you're looking at three, $400 just to go to the game, plus the things on top, you know, the driving, the commute, and all those other aspects. And I think you're putting an unnecessary financial pressure on people who probably just want to please their children or want to please themselves by getting to one game a year and I think what what it does do um is creates this bit this um yeah just a bit of a murky sort of taste in my mouth if I'm being honest particularly because we all know you know Liverpool Football Club is in a very healthy financial state there is no need to sell these tickets at this price to balance the books like that's not a an existing need so why why would you why would you do that and you know as you pointed out before they may not set the pricing it may be through various different external organizations who you know coordinate everything but at the same time you know it is Liverpool Football Club the ultimate buck lies with them they are responsible for what their tickets sell for um, and in respect of they should know and they should be aware of the fans financial abilities and capabilities and this ticket pricing suggests to me that they're not now, I want to move on to transfers, but before I do so, I just want to take a second to say the reason we're having this conversation, and I know it's not the sexiest topic to talk about, but since we started day one with podcasts, with this channel, we've been massive advocates for overseas fans. We've been massive advocates to bring people together and to show that this is a community of Reds around the world. It doesn't matter if you're in America or Australia, wherever it is. So for me, I saw this as a massive slap in the face, and I know Cash did as well, which is why... We spent the first 10 minutes of this stream talking about it because it just doesn't seem right to me. It doesn't seem right to Cash. But look, that's our take on it anyway. We'd love to know your thoughts in the comments below. Cash, time to get on to the sexy stuff. Transfers. Mm -hmm. Now, we're both not really massive fans of Mina Riola. We're basing, basing this off our conversations beforehand. And it looks like Mina Riola might be using Liverpool um, as a bit of a make way or a bit of a way to add a, a little bit of extra grease to his cash in this potential delete deal because it's been rumoured since day one that he's Barcelona bound. Now PSG are after coming in. They have their own FFP issues as well. They're looking to bring in other players. It just seems like Mina Real is hawking him around to try and finally get Barcelona to pay the rumoured 11 million quid that he wants for this deal. Well, exactly. I mean, I think there's a whole... Again, I, I know I've referenced it before, but it both topics we've discussed so far really reveal the sort of underbelly to football that we don't like. Um, and I think this is this is an evidence of that. I mean, the first thing to say is that Mino Raiola shouldn't even be allowed to operate this summer. He has a ban, or he is supposed to be banned, uh, for this window, I believe, for reasons that I don't think have been made public, but it's to do with the transfer of players, but that's been suspended, so he is operational. So that's the first thing. There's no smoke without fire there, as far as I'm concerned. The second thing is that if you look at this guy's history, Paul Pogba being the key example, I mean, he brokered that deal probably not really in the players' interests in terms of um, in terms of 
where was best for him to go in his career, as we've seen. Um, although, obviously, there was an element of nostalgia about him going back to Man United. But if you actually look at why he went there and why he pushed that deal, it was because he got what I believe to be... I cannot remember off the top 20, of my head. I think, 23 million. 23 million, pardon me. Okay, thank you. Um, that was that, that was the amount that he got from that particular deal. Now, so if you look at what agents are supposed to be, what traditionally they were meant to be, yes, they are financially remunerated for what they do, as anyone should be. But you've you've gotten to this stage where it's a completely unregulated minefield where agents know that if they have players as their clients and that player has a you know extreme financial value they know that if they pursue the best deal for them financially not even necessarily the player they know that that's not really going to be regulated it's not really going to be scrutinized to the degree that it should be so Mina Riola for me is the epitome of an agent who doesn't have his player's best interests at heart and his own financial interests that shouldn't be allowed to happen but because of the rules or lack thereof that we have it is allowed to happen and he's allowed to be as scrupulous as he wants what I don't like is the fact that he's trying to bring that to our door. We, it was revealed obviously earlier this year that we have the biggest agents fees for that. For the, we had the biggest agent fees. Sorry, pardon me for the for the season just gone. I believe, um, and I'm certain I'm right on that. So, for me, there's a there's definite element of let's just tout this player to this club. Maybe they'll bite, but if they don't, it'll leverage the position more strongly for the suitors that really want him. Notwithstanding the fact that it's not fair on the player, it's not fair on the club, it's not fair on the centre backs we currently have. Because the next point I want to go on to is the morality of the whole thing aside, or the lack of morality of the whole thing aside, I don't actually personally believe we need Delight. I don't think we need him. I mean, if you look, obviously there's a lot of fanfare about him, particularly because of Ajax's run in the Champions League, and rightly so, he seems like an excellent player. There is a clamour to see him join up with Van Dyke at both club and international level. But if you actually look at our centre backs, maybe this, you know, not Dan Lovren, but if you actually look at Matip and Joel Matip, or sorry, Matip, pardon me, and Joe Gomez, you've got two excellent centre backs there. What more does Joel Matip need to do to be considered an excellent centre back? Joe Gomez, I watched him last night and or yesterday, was it in that dead pan game against that crap game against Switzerland? He's excellent. He's an excellent player. And yes, I I know that injuries have limited his availability, and that is a concern. But that doesn't mean that we need to go out and spend what would be probably a world record fee again for a centre back. I don't think we need to, and I don't think Mina Raiola should be pushing that agenda. Two things on that. Let me start with the the agent thing. I keep banging about this. I keep going on about this, but I cannot think of another sport where football, where clubs are paying these agents fees. In American sports, to the best of my knowledge, the player pays his agent, and I know that Mat- Matthias Delit will pay his agent as well, but not the $23 million that Riola received for the Pogba deal or not the proposed $11 million that Riola wants for this deal. He'll get his, whatever it is, 15% cut of his wages or his endorsements or whatever the hell it is. So that needs to stop. That need to, A line needs to be drawn there and we need yep. to say... But even at that, am I being, am I being very... Uh, Naive? Will it just be passed off some other way? Will they just repackage it and will it just end up being paid on top of the transfer fee anyway and the agent will end up getting his cut? And secondly, another thing that I think a lot of people are forgetting about when we talk about Matthias Delit is, yeah, he's an absolutely top-level, sought-after centre-back, but we kind of have a young sought-after centre-back already come from Ajax that's in our system, that's doing quite well, that we can't block the pathway for, and that, of course, is Keanu Hoover. Yeah, that's true. That's a really good point, actually. And I think um, that is something I didn't actually consider before that. So thank you. I mean, what I would say is that he's obviously very young. I don't think he's quite ready. But if you look at his potential, it's clearly sizable. Um, and as you said, that would block that would block his pathway. I mean, we've we've got some very capable centre backs. I mean, there was even a period where Nat Phillips was considered maybe could potentially step in. That's that seems less likely, but you know, you're in a position where that would be totally impossible. And, you know, you've got to look at what the club is meant to embody you in the sense of, yes, you, you spend, but you also bring through from the Academy. So if you look at Trent Alexander Arnold, again, in that crap game against Switzerland, he was by far and away the best player, an Academy product nurtured by the club, brought through by the club, didn't pay a penny for him. And that is evidence that that system at Liverpool and Kirby works if it's allowed to work. So, 
if you bring in delight from Ajax, I think you, it blocks pathways. And what I would say is that we just don't need the player. We don't need the player. We don't like he's a great player, but we don't need him. We don't need the inevitable sort of financial burden that that would put on us to pay his agent. And given that it's essentially inevitable that those agency rules are the rules that permit agents to make so much money aren't going to be changed this summer or in the near future. Why would you do like why is the club why would why would the club do that? It's not financially responsible and it's not responsible in terms of the player personnel either. We'll move on to Bruno Fernandes and this is a player that's been linked to Manchester City, Liverpool, Manchester United and Spurs. And the latest things I'm seeing and of course take all of this with a pinch of salt is that Earlier on, I seen a publication in Portugal say that Liverpool are favourites to sign Bruno Fernandes, and we've heard the player himself come out and say that he would rather have played for Liverpool over Manchester City because he believes the Gagan Preston style of play would sue his game more. Now, we didn't mention Manchester United, but then just before I came on here, I was starting to see a couple of things on social media, which, of course, you have to take with a pinch of salt, that Manchester United are in pole position to sign Bruno Fernandes. Now, I haven't seen much of this guy. Connor mm. raves about him. I know Chris thinks he's a very good footballer as well. What are your thoughts on this situation? Well, I mean, what the first thing that I would say is that um, he would suit the kind of player profile that Man United seem to be going for now rather than obviously bringing in people that are past their prime on massive wages. They seem to be bringing in younger players if Daniel James is anything to go by. So that would be the first thing. Secondly, though, the reason that he probably didn't mention Man United in his, uh, in his comments was because why would you want to go play for a team who finished sixth in their domestic league, who have no real tangible direction as a club, and who have a manager who, you know, is at the wheel, but for how long? So, for me, it probably isn't... If that deal were to happen, I feel like that would be a very agent-driven deal, you know, in reference to the conversation we've just had. So, I wouldn't be so fearful of Man United's interest. If it comes down to Man United's tangible interest versus our tangible interest, we'll get the player. That's my view. Um, In terms of him, himself... I haven't really seen him play, and, and but then obviously ahead of the pod, I did some research, and he is, in terms of what we could need, he is excellent. So, 24, midfielder, he, in two, like last year, the year before last, sorry, he was named the Portuguese League's best player, player of the year, and then this year, you have to obviously caveat this with, it's the Portuguese League, so it is weaker, but this year, he was the highest ever goal-scoring midfielder in the Portuguese league ever of all time with what I read to be 20 goals in the league, three goals in the Europa League and 13 assists in the league and two assists in the Europa League. So those numbers are huge for a midfielder. And when you compare with our midfielders from this season, I won't obviously call them out, but if you combine Jordan Henderson, James Milner, Gini Wijnaldum, Fabinho and Naby Keita, those five players, between the five of them, they have, quick maths here, 14 goals in the Premier League. So between the five of them, they've got less goals, obviously, than he got in the league. Obviously, the leagues are different in terms of quality. But if you're looking at suitability, he definitely suits what we would need. And and that's all I can say on that. The numbers do suggest that he would really, really fit well into the system. Um, But if it comes down to us having genuine interest and United having genuine interest, I think the player would rather come to us, obviously. It's very important here that we point out we will not have a word said against the number six. We absolutely adore the number six on this show. The number six is massive. And United have gone out and signed the Welsh Messi, which has been he has been christened. Um I think it's a good actually the Daniel James thing slightly off the I think that's quite a good bit of business by United and that's definitely an eighteen million pound roll of the dice they can afford to take for a young player like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean as much as I'm you know, as much as I can be impressed with anything they do I felt like it was a refreshing change of pace from what they've done previously. Um, he is electric. He's very, very quick. Um, will he be moulded appropriately? United time will tell. But um, as I said, I think he's much more of an unpolished diamond than the likes of Fernandez. And so if you're looking at who could come in and make a genuine impact, it, it, I mean, he would certainly make that for us and for United. So hopefully if the interest is real and we need him and we get the right price, why not? I'm in the position where I believe anybody we're interested in should, and I've used this phrase many times, crawl over broken glass to come and play for this football club, this manager, these supporters, right now, reigning European champions, back-to-back Champions League finalists, setting ridiculous points totals in the leagues, going head-to-head. The only thing that can go head-to-head with that all-conquering Manchester, well, almost all-conquering Manchester City team. So... For me, if it's a choice, as you touched on earlier on, between Liverpool United, Liverpool or Spurs, whoever it might be, 
you're going to want to play for Jurgen Klopp. Surely you're going to want to come here and play for Klopp. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think I think the um, I think the only draw that any of those teams would have over us is Spurs' new stadium. I think that is obviously a, a, an asset for them. But you look at there's there's uncertainty around a lot of their squad and stuff. So. You look at clubs that are entirely certain within their identity. You look at a club that's entirely, you know, riding on the crest of a winning wave, i.e. with the Champions League win. You're, you're, you're not walking into a project that's in its inception. You're walking into a project that's midway through its sort of completion or, or slightly less than or whatever. So it's, it'd be very exciting for a player. And I can only think from a human perspective, my ego would be totally stroked if a club like Liverpool wanted me, much more so than if a club like Spurs or Man United did in the present situation. It won't be lost on any player that Liverpool are interested in. The the game against Barcelona, the images from the parade after the Champions League final, that won't yeah. be lost on players. They're, they're going to want to be part of that. We've seen what it meant to young Ryan Brewster, who was on the bench for the Champions League final. and he You could just see him on the bus, and he was just soaking it all up, just looking forward to licking his lips, knowing this season he's going to get the leash taken off him. He's going to get a chance to go and prove himself. Um, yeah, so I agree with everything you've said. This is We are... We're no longer a possible stepping stone club. I think we're a destination club now, Cash, and that therein lies the difference. And it's great times. But there's one player that I wanted to talk about before we finish up on transfers, and he has probably divided opinion amongst Reds over this summer more than anybody else, and that is young Harry Wilson. Now, I've seen a report in the Echo today, and this is contradictory to other reports that I've seen. I've seen some reports say Liverpool are willing to cash in a fee of around twenty to twenty-five million pound, but. The Echo have come out today and said that Jurgen Klopp is willing to give Harry Wilson pre-season to prove himself and that he has belief in the young man and he wants to see what he can do on the pre-season tour. I mean, I think I think the first thing to say is that... Um, well, yeah, that's, sorry, I've just lost my train of thought for a sec. The first thing to say is that Harry Wilson is a very, very good player. I mean, if you look at his stats from last year from Derby, I'm just going to pull them up, you know... He is 22, so he's not super young. I mean, he's young, but he's not like, you know, an, a baby, if you like. He's not a teenager. He's two years younger than Trent Alexander, or older, sorry, than Trent. Um, you know, 40, go- 40 appearances for Derby, 16 goals, four assists. Good return. But if you... He, he was key in a team in the championship chasing promotion. That is hugely different to being even significant for a team with our aspirations. So... I mean, I suppose the, the whole idea of a player being good is bandied around a lot, but you've got to look at the, that description within the context of what level they're playing at. So, of course, he's excellent at championship level, but that won't necessarily transcend to Premier League level. The second thing to say is that, obviously, we're under no financial pressure to sell him at any given... Like, you know, we could sell him at any point. So, if Jurgen Klopp thinks it's wise to give him the tour to prove himself, then then fine, do that. I mean, it's not like we need to sell him to fund transfers, for example. So... I would agree with Jurgen if he decided to do that, but hand on heart, my belief is that he was excellent at that level, and his appropriate level is something above that, but not our level. I mean, if you address two points that you made previously, one on the the last chat we did, and it was about he would stay if Jordan Shakiri goes. That was sort of the discussion we had. He's not going anywhere, and neither he should. Jordan Shakiri, I mean. And then the second point that you referenced before is the fact that Liverpool's no longer a, a journey club or a project club or a journey club, it's a destination club. I think Harry Wilson would have been perfect when we were a journey club. And Absolutely I think, agree. And if you if you evolve, if you look at football in cycles, he is very much coming to Liverpool in his sort of he's he's gotten to a point where he's really playing his best football, probably a cycle too late for him to make the grade with us. And I think it's interesting if you contrast I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to draw parallels between him and Daniel James, both Welsh, both young, both very, very good wingers. That's the kind of player United are going for now, da- the Daniel James mould. We're now a step above that, and we want someone that isn't in that mould. We want someone who can perform and be sublime for a destination club, not a project club. So it's it's unfortunate for him, but I think if you bring him in for pre-season, give him the tour, maybe that'll settle the club's worries in terms of have we let him go too prematurely? But being honest, I think you could not do that, let him go, insert a buyback clause and probably never use it. And that would be okay. Yeah, I think some people are getting blinded by the highlight reel goals that they've seen from yeah. the championship this season. And looking into it a little bit deeper and, and interacting with a few people who've watched Derby, probably more than I have, 
there seems to be this belief that he has disappeared at times from games. He has been irrelevant in big moments. And, and you know what? That's okay. That's okay for a young player. But is it okay for a young player to then expect him to be dropped into a Champions League game and be able to raise that level? I don't know. Maybe it's a sink or swim moment and maybe he will swim. But as you said, it makes perfect sense for Jurgen Klopp to take a look at him. Um, Frank Lampard did a very good job with him I think we should take time to give credit to Frank Lampard as well he got the game time Jurgen Klopp would have wanted he got the opportunities he scored the goals you cannot doubt those numbers but it is like it just that step up is what worries me it is a massive step up from a team looking to get into the top six in the championship to a team looking to win the Premier League and the European Cup I mean I think the cynic in me says that if Harry Wilson was really made to meant to make the grade at Liverpool he would have influenced that uh, the Champions League sorry the championship playoff final a lot more than he did he was actually and I watched um I watched the game because I was interested in it and I he he was pretty anonymous if we're being honest he didn't influence the game he didn't grab it by the scruff of the neck he didn't do any of the things that a player with Liverpool aspirations really needs to do uh, and that's not me saying that with any pleasure that's that's a shame for him but that's what it came across as to me, if you contrast that with Jack Grealish, for example, who was very good for Aston Villa on the day, similar types of players, both wing players, both very like, exciting on the ball, but one player sees the game and essentially determined its direction, and it wasn't Harry Wilson. So if he can't do it at that level, what's to what's to confirm that he could do it at the Liverpool level? And that's what you've got to look at in terms of asking the ruthless and necessary questions. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how he gets on over the summer. Um, before we finish up, there was a bit of news that I seen last night that I actually want to applaud for once. I don't give you away for much credit, if I'm being honest, but they're hoping to bring in a rule that would allow an additional substitution for players that have suffered concussion, and they aim to have this in by 2021. Now, immediately when you say this, people become cynical, and I was the same. And I got into a conversation with a couple of people on Twitter where I was... I was thinking as well, well, this could be abused. And then you, you think, well, could it be abused because one VAR would be able to see if there was any clear and obvious um, uh, hit, I suppose, on the person's head. And then secondly, somebody came up with a really good point that there should be, and maybe this is already in place, an automatic seven-day period where if you're taken off a concussion, you can't play for seven days. I think that might actually be in place. So that that's might already, be a deterrent. I mean, that's why Mo Salah didn't play against Barcelona in the second leg, because he... They have the rule in place where you're not allowed to play for a week. I mean, it is interesting, I think, like the, the point that you make about it being open to abuse. I mean, that that's the same for every sort of every rule in football to, to a degree. You know, you've got to look at the seriousness of concussion and what it can lead to. I mean, if you look at over the last sort of year to 18 months, there have been three serious incidents with concussion that I can think of. You had the one with Fabian Schaar. This year, I think he was um, playing for Switzerland at the time. He's the Newcastle defender. You have David Ospina, uh, David Ospina uh, playing for Napoli. And then, obviously, the one Jan Vertonghen in the Champions League semi-final. The Jan Vertonghen one is the most sort of high-profile because he was he was assessed. This is what I read and what I understood to be the case. He was assessed for three minutes, was determined that he could play. He came back on, staggered around, declared himself unable to continue, went off. So you, you, there is a correlation between footballers and dementia later on in life. There is a correlation between you know, concussion and diseases that are suffered later on in life. If you look at other sports, American football being the key example, concussion is treated with the sort of seriousness and with the respect that it deserves. It's a serious, serious injury. So what you have... it. Uh, it's actually interesting because I listened to a podcast on this when the Jan Vertonghen thing happened and there was a guy from a charity on brain injuries called Headway. His name was Luke Griggs and he was talking about the fact that when a player is concussed like that in a high-profile game, Champions League semi-final, there's so many external pressures that will influence the decision to allow him to continue playing and probably not assess him for long enough. So if you were to bring in this extra substitution, even if it was temporary, let's say the player is deemed able to, able to continue, but if you were to bring in this substitution, what it would do is it would relieve the footballing base pressure to essentially maybe take a take a risk with a with the player's you know health. So, for example, with Jan Vertonghen, he was assessed. Luke Grigg says he wasn't assessed for long enough. He should have been taken down the tunnel and assessed for in excess of five minutes. 
that didn't happen. If you have the temporary sub, that could have happened. And then you can look at it from a purely health perspective and make a purely clinical decision. What he also said, which I thought was interesting, was that he thinks, and I don't know whether this would be realistic, that an independent doctor should come or should be there to assess um, a player's concussion. And it shouldn't just be the club doctors because you want to remove as many footballing-based pressures and potential biases from the decision as possible. So what the substitution would do, for me it's a no-brainer, pun intended, you you allow the extra sub, there has to be some criteria put in place where it's clear and obvious, not to use VAR speak, but it's clear and obvious that the player is potentially concussed, there's evidence to suggest that's the case, you bring on the sub, you allow the appropriate length of assessments to take place without putting any kind of detrimental impact on the game, if the player can continue, which is very rarely the case, being honest let them come back on, and if they can't, which is more often the case, then take them off and allow them to recuperate and give it the respect it deserves. For me, as you said at the start of the question, you don't give UEFA that much credit, and rightly so, but this is one instance in which you would say, yes, this is the correct thing, and arguably, if you want to be critical of them, which we obviously do, they should have done it way sooner. Yeah, one thing on this, I suppose, all of us who are cynics and and believe that these things are open to abuse... I suppose we should take a second to say that we have no right to question the ethics of any doctor in this situation. But as you rightly said, there is sometimes external pressures on here. Now, is it right for me to point to the whole Jose Mourinho incident at that time with with the yeah, Chelsea it's, club doctor? It's, it's, um, it's a really good point. I mean, doc- I think, I think I'm sorry, doctors will want to serve the best interests of the players. They will, but the idea of having that non-club associated doctor on hands and the money's in football at the highest level for this to happen absolutely i think it's a brilliant idea i absolutely agree with what you've said well i thought i mean this is what i mean it's not my idea it's the guy from the charity but i think i i remember hearing that at the time and i remember when we spoke about this before i thought i need to find that guy and find his name and pull those comments out because doctors at their at their heart should be are ethical their patients will obviously be their priority but let's say for example Jan Vertonghen, um, in that situation, the doctor makes the call to take him out of the game and Spurs go on, and they take him out of the game and then the Spurs go on to lose that semi-final, t- semi-final tie. It would be completely remiss of us to say that behind the scenes, whether overtly or subtly, there's not certain fingers pointing saying, well, if that doctor had allowed Jan Vertonghen to say, oh, we could be in the Champions League final right now. So there's, there's very much that thing of, yes, the player's health is paramount, but when the pressures of the game are so high, when the financial, the global, you know, the footballing stakes are so massive, you cannot always trust the people that are totally associated with the club and work there day in and day out won't be influenced by the pressure to make the decisions for the best of the club when really the decision has to be made for the best in the best interests of the player. Yeah, I, I do question though why this would take to twenty twenty one. It does yeah. that that's the only part of this that doesn't seem to make any sense. It seems a fairly easy thing to implement. Now, there are, there are new rules. that are, I know that has to be voted. It has to go through ratification. And there is all that side of it as well. But there are new rules coming into place, I think, at the end of this month. I mean, it's the same organisation that put the Europa League final in fucking, you know, Azerbaijan. Like, it's, it is an organisation that's a bit of a clown cart. And I think, you know, even... You're right to say, though, that even decisions that should be completely without... You know, this, this should be a no... You know, this shouldn't face any opposition. This shouldn't be contested. This is very clearly the correct decision you know for for everyone involved it's like it's similar in in a sense to when they brought in um you know the spray for free kicks that then like goes away just it was it's similar to that not in terms of seriousness but in terms of this is something that can make the game better let's bring it in no questions asked same with the goal line technology with the watches that the referee wear like i mean that's something that's unequivocal it's a no-brainer so this is the same and i think i think it, it, it the fact that it's taken so long harks to a bigger problem of the fact that these players earn a lot of money, they've got a very privileged life, but ultimately they're kind of treated like commodities when really they're human beings with, you know, things outside of football that they would very much like to be alive and, you know, in full command of their brain faculties for. So I think there's a real dismissal of the fact that they are human beings and you've got to put all the infrastructure in place to give them the best opportunity possible to be diagnosed with a concussion as and when it happens. You've also got to 100% remove the decision from the player's hands because there is a macho factor that goes on in football and it's still there, the whole idea of hard men, particularly around defenders and midfielders, actually. So you've got to remove that as well. I mean, 
I hope we're getting to a point where if we see a player feel like he has to go off with a concussion or a head injury, that he isn't undermined in any way. Because as you said, they have a life to live. And I've seen, oh, I'm a massive boxing fan. And I've seen umpteen times where boxers have collapsed hours after a fight. Um, and it happened actually recently this weekend. There was an incident with, um, I'm trying to think of the gentleman's name, the guy that fought, Zach, or Zab Judah, excuse me. He was mm. fighting at 41 years of age after being out of the ring for three years. He came back in and again, he was stopped but he went back into the restroom, all was fine, and then he ended up getting taken to the hospital. And I'm, I'm sure he would have had many medical examinations after the fight because, you know, it's a boxing fight. You get doctors are there in between every single round looking into your eyes. And again, there's the macho aspect of, no, no, let me go on, coach. Let me go on, let me go on. That has to be taken out of the players' hands as well. Absolutely. I mean, but that, I mean, in boxing, obviously, that is one thing that they do do well in the sense that, you know, decisions are made for the athlete. And I think... In, in football, I mean, the, the disappointing thing with the Jan Vertonghen scenario, and I remember this happened with Hugo Lloris a few years ago when he actually was allowed to continue the game and clearly wasn't right. But with Jan Vertonghen, he was the one that had to say, I can't play. Now, that decision, he shouldn't have to assume the guilt of stepping out of a game of that magnitude. He shouldn't have to be like, I can't do this. The professionals in place should be like, look, Jan, you can't do this, you can't play. Um, and he shouldn't have to make that call because I think that puts a lot of weight on his shoulders. Um, what I would say as well is that if you look at the macho attitude of football, you're right to touch on it. There's, I mean, even even in England still, it's totally eulogised that whole Terry Butcher bandage over your head, you know, will die for the cause kind of bullshit or whatever. And it's like, for, for me, it's that shouldn't be eulogised. That type of thing shouldn't be idealised because at the end of the day, you can be a warrior on the pitch and not have to incur a brain injury to prove that. You know, and I think with the situation with concussion, it's like it's almost like because heading isn't the biggest aspect of the game. Obviously, it's a part of the game, but it's in theory, it's meant to be played with your feet. So it's almost like they've been like, oh, actually, shit, this is something that we now need to look at. But I mean, you're right. The the the, the, the stupidly masculine toxicity that exists in football um, probably has stopped this from being introduced much, much sooner. Um, and sadly... We don't know. Nobody has died as of yet, but I wouldn't be surprised that if later on in their lives you see players with various types of ailments who were formerly footballers and who headed the ball a lot. We've seen it with other injuries. We've seen it with um, arthritis. We've seen it with players' knees and, and other things as well that they've been banjacked after the footballing careers because they weren't looked after properly and were treated like. I won't say commodities back in those days, but we're treated like a, an asset of the clubs, and I suppose maybe that is a commodity. Um, look, I'd love to keep talking more on this one, Cash, but again, time has beaten us. If anybody wants to check out more of Cash's stuff, Cash is uh, somebody who has many tricks or many strings to her bow. She's. <laughs> oh, look, I'll let you pitch it yourself, Cash. I don't want to get this wrong, but you're involved in law, you're involved in LGBTQ, you're involved in, <laughs> in politics, you're involved, you're studying journalism, of course, you do stuff on football, you write mm-hmm. as well some articles. Are you still working, are you still writing stuff with Rush the Cop? Uh, no, not at the moment, because the guy, um, the founder, he has sold the, the, the website domain, so we, it's sort of up in the air at the moment. Yeah, but as I said, she's got so much to do, so many things. You can see at Cash Boyle there underneath, Cash can't see it at this moment, but I can. <laughs> underneath her picture there, you can see her Twitter handle if you want to give her a follow. Is there anything you've got coming up, Cash, or you've got any comedy nights or comedy shows coming up? Nothing at the moment, Craig, to be honest. I'm just sort of focusing on... Um, I've got a few things to finish up with my journalism diploma and I'm focusing on my writing and stuff as well. So really, nothing nothing imminent, but if there is anything, I will obviously put it on my page. <laughs> Absolutely, and do go and check out Cash's account. It is, uh, what's the phrase, a smorgasbord of beautiful opinions <laughs> on various topics, whereas my Twitter account is always just very, I'm very one-dimensional. It's all Liverpool-centric. Oh, I wish that was more one-dimensional, Craig. It'd probably be better for me, so don't worry. It's always a pleasure, Cash, and I know you're off for this month, so I'm going to be pestering you again, and we'll get you back on for another chat and hopefully another podcast very soon. I hope so. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Talk to you soon, Cash. And Bye. guys, don't forget, if you've enjoyed the stream, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, comment below. If there's anything you disagree that myself and Cash mentioned or anything you think we've forgotten to have a chat about, please do let us know, and we'll catch up with you real soon. Up the motherfucking Reds.